This is the Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, lead us, feed us, guide us, direct us. Enlighten the hearts of the people who listen in Radio Land. We'll give God the praise. Because we send out this program in the name of Jesus. And we send it out for Jesus' sake. Amen. On the last broadcast, we were discussing those who are sleeping in Jesus. I'm going to read briefly, that is hurriedly, and discuss briefly, by way of review, the passage that we discussed on the last broadcast, lest some of you might have missed the program and did not get this wonderful verse of Scripture, or verses, these verses. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant. Underline that. I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. Now the world can't understand the Bible, but every man that has the Holy Spirit of God has the teacher of the book in his heart. And every born-again, blood-washed child of God has the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit, he is not God's. 1 John 2, 27 says that the Spirit teaches you. You know, I tell you, it's pitiful when some fellows feel that God has given them an insight on the Bible and nobody else knows anything about the Bible but them. And they say that God put them in a trance and they went way up on a mountain somewhere and talked to God and God gave them a revelation. Let me tell you something. Everything we need to know about God and man, heaven and hell, and the devil and eternity, we'll find it in this Bible. This Bible is God's inspired Word, and it is the Word of God, and it is all the Word of God. There hasn't been any new epistles added since God gave John the revelation. Now, I'm saying all that to say this. First John 2.27, if you're born again, you have the author and the teacher of this book in your heart. You'll never understand all of it. I'll never understand all of it. But the only way on earth to ever understand any of it is through the Spirit and comparing Scripture with Scripture and spiritual things with spiritual. Now then in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. Now Peter says that some are willingly ignorant. But Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Asleep. Get it? That you saw not as others who have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus. I'm reading slow, doing it intentionally. I'm trying to, by the grace of God, I'm trying to slow down just a little bit on the radio because... Some dear people say, Preacher, I tell you, we just can't absorb it. You go so fast, we can't absorb it. Well, you know, when you pay as much for radio time as I do on all stations, you have to talk fast and get a lot said. Now, I'll try to slow down a little bit. Asleep in Jesus, that you sorrow not as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep, in Jesus will God bring with Jesus, see, with him. And the him certainly refers to Jesus. Now, how is God going to bring them with Jesus if they're not with Jesus in the first place? If they're in the grave, then God will have to come down and get them and carry them where Jesus is and then bring them. But it doesn't say that. You know why? Because they're not in the grave. The body has gone back to dust. But the spirit, the soul, has gone to be with the Lord. For this we send you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, we which are living and remain, 
under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or hinder or precede them which are asleep for the Lord himself. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Well, they are asleep in Jesus. Jesus is in heaven, and Jesus is coming from heaven with a shout, and he's going to bring the asleep in Jesus with him. All right, so those who are born again, their departed spirits are with Jesus. They are asleep in Jesus. Now, if he's unconscious, they are unconscious. But if he's conscious, they're conscious because they're in Jesus. And he's going to bring them with him when he comes. He's going to bring the spirit to be united with a glorified body. This mortal body must put on immortality. And the spirit will unite with the immortal body. And then we'll all be caught up together with the Lord in the air, in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ. Now, you see, if you dear people would just look at uh, the word of God, and the reason I'm reviewing this today is because it's so important. If you would just look at it. You see, the Bible says in verse 13 and 14, that these people that Jesus will bring with him are asleep. Now it says that the dead in Christ, the dead, shall rise first. Now is a sleeping person a dead person? Is a sleeping person an unconscious person? No, they're conscious. They're not unconscious. And they're not dead. They're resting. And that's exactly what the righteous are doing now. They're resting. I repeat again, I'm going over this again because of its importance. It is, it is important that you see what this precious passage teaches. In verse 13 and 14, they are referred to as being asleep in Jesus. Just like Lazarus, the Lord said he's sleeping. They said, well, let's not disturb him. And then Jesus told them that he was dead. His body was dead. His spirit wasn't dead. And he wasn't dead, but his body was and beginning to decay. All right. For the Lord himself, verse 16, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. The Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ, the dead bodies in the grave, the dead bodies of the spirits in Christ. See? shall rise, the bodies shall rise. Turn to Matthew 27, and many of the bodies of the saints, the bodies, the saints didn't arise, but the bodies of the saints arose, and the saints went into those bodies as God breathed into Adam's nostrils, and he became a living soul. The spirits united with the bodies, and they walked the streets of Jerusalem. The Bible distinctly says in Matthew 27, that many of the bodies arose. It didn't say many of the saints. It did not say many of the saints, but it said many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose. They were sleeping in Jesus. Their bodies were in the cemetery in Jerusalem. When Jesus arose from the dead and brought their spirits out of the paradise in the heart of the earth, the spirits that he led captive and brought out of the paradise, united with the resurrected bodies, they walked the streets of Jerusalem, and then he led them to the paradise above all heavens. And that's where they are now. The dead in Christ. They are sleeping in verse 13 and 14. In verse 16, they're dead. Verse 13 and 14 are talking about the spirit. Verse 16 is talking about the body. And the body will be saved when the rapture occurs. Our salvation will not be totally and 100% complete until the rapture of the church. And when the rapture of the church takes place, the spirits will unite with the glorified immortal bodies, the immortal soul will unite with an immortal body and will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. 
and so shall we ever be with our Lord. They shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now I close the last broadcast by making this statement. Isn't it a lot of comfort to you mothers to know that your boy that was killed on a battlefield is over there somewhere in the dust unconscious? Isn't that wonderful? That's really wonderful, isn't it? Huh? No, it isn't. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. I say the fourth time, no, it isn't. But I tell you what is wonderful, to know that even though his body has gone back to the dust on a foreign battlefield, that your saved, born-again, soldier boy, sailor boy, or whatever, the Spirit has gone to rest with Jesus until you get there. And praise God, he's not unconscious on a battlefield. He's not unconscious in a grave. He's not unconscious in the bottom of the ocean. He's not unconscious anywhere. He's very much conscious and resting in Jesus and awaiting the resurrection of the body and the homecoming of all the saints. And then, praise God, we'll all be complete in him. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 is given by the Holy Spirit to clear up and to prevent spiritual ignorance concerning the dead who died in Jesus and they are sleeping in Jesus, their bodies having gone back to the dust. Now, that is just as plain and just as simple as it can be. All right, now we're going to that passage, that much, much discussed passage, Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. We're going to read, I'll hardly get to discuss it very much today, but we're going to read it and then we're going to discuss it from A to Z and Z back to A, from the first word to the last word. We're going to analyze it. We're going to put it under the microscope of the Bible. We're going to look at it through the mirror of the Bible. We're going to pray God's Holy Ghost to teach us. And if you'll open your mind and throw away your ideas and your traditions and your little books and get the book, the Word of God, and sit by the radio and listen, I'll show you some things that you can see and you'll never doubt as long as you live. The Bible says in verse 19 of the 16th chapter of Luke, there was a certain rich man. The next statement is, he was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. There was a certain rich man. There was a certain beggar. Is that a parable? Is that a parable? You say it certainly is. All right. Is this a parable? Listen. Is this a parable? I'm reading. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord, Ananias. And he said, I'm here, Lord. The Lord said, Arise, go into the street called Straight, inquired the house of Judas, one called Saul. He's praying. Is that a parable? Is that a parable, beloved? Is that a parable, beloved? There was a certain disciple named Ananias, and God spoke to Ananias, and God said, Ananias, go to the house of Saul, uh, and, uh, Simon. There's a man named Saul praying. Is that, a, is that a parable? Then I want to say, bless the Lord, if that's not a parable, then God bless you, Luke 16, 19 is not a parable. There was a rich man, clothed in purple and fine linen. He fared sumptuously every day. There was a beggar named Lazarus. Now listen, if there was a certain disciple named Ananias, there was a certain man, a beggar named Lazarus. Now, beloved, listen. I'll go along with you as long as a verse of Scripture is vague. If you find a verse of Scripture that's vague and you cannot, to save your life, see the meaning of it, and from the standpoint of Comparing Scripture with Scripture, you just can't find the meaning. 
I'll go along with you. But I'm not going along with anybody that will say that is a parable when it's as plain as the English language can state there was a certain rich man. This certain rich man was a rich man that was very peculiar. He dressed in purple and fine linen. That's what he wore. And every day he lived sumptuously. Not all rich men do that. Not all rich men wear purple and fine linen. No, sir. But there was a certain rich man. He was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus. He was laid at the rich man's gate full of sores. There was a certain disciple named Ananias. The same Holy Ghost wrote both verses through holy men. Now let me tell you something. There is absolutely no excuse for anybody taking the Word of God and warping it and twisting it to fit their ideas to prove their point. Now let me tell you, beloved, I'm not trying to prove a religious point. I'm not trying to cram religion down your throat. What do you say, preacher, don't you think anybody else has a right to their interpretation just like you have a right to your interpretation? Listen, I'm not interpreting. I'm comparing Scripture with Scripture like 1 Corinthians 2.11 tells me to do. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says to compare spiritual things with spiritual. And the only way in the world that you'll ever understand the Bible and the truths of God's Word is to compare Scripture with Scripture. Here's what it says. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man, which is in man, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. All right, now listen. In verse 13, which things we speak, not in the words of man's wisdom, see, not in the words of man's wisdom, but, uh, listen, which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, if the Holy Ghost of God said to Luke, the same man wrote Acts that wrote the Gospel of Luke. Don't you forget that. Luke, inspired of God Almighty, wrote the book of Acts. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke that ch contains chapter 16 about the rich man. The Holy Ghost said to Luke, there was a certain rich man, there was a beggar named Lazarus. The same Holy Ghost said, there was a certain disciple in uh, Damascus named Ananias. Now listen, don't tell me that the Holy Ghost named Lazarus, and that's a parable, named Ananias, and that's a true incident. The angel Gabriel came and spoke to Mary. Is that a parable? No. The Holy Ghost dictated the same words, the words of God, the inspired, verbally inspired word of God, and you can't get around it. Now, what I want to point out, and then I'll have to go today. The next verse says, The beggar desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, and the dogs came and licked his sores. Came to pass, came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now, in O W present tense, now he is unconscious, and you're unconscious? No, uh-uh, no. Now, in O W present tense, now, now, he is comforted and thou art tormented now. Do you believe this? Beloved, now are we the sons of God. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm God's son now? Then does it mean in Luke 16, 25, now, Thou art comforted, and he is tormented. Now, does it mean now, or does it mean somewhere out yonder in the future? 
Beloved, listen. There is no excuse, positively no excuse, for anybody, anybody, stumbling over Luke 16. Now let me tell you something. You'd better stop worrying about whether that's a parable or not a parable, and you'd better get right with God if you're not. Because one day it's coming to pass that you're going to die, and you're going to face the same God that the rich man and Lazarus faced. Heavenly Father, take this message and use it to the glory of our God and save the soul, Father, that's nearest hell for Jesus' sake. Amen.